Great, so thank you so much to the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity. My name is Harley Katz. I'm currently a visitor at the University of Oxford. And over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna be presenting a project that we recently put on the archive about how we're comparing uh, our radiative transfer simulations with observations. So there's sort of two main questions I'd like to address with this talk. As you've heard a number of times, studying galaxies directly in the epoch of reionization is incredibly difficult for a number of reasons. So a lot of us focus on what we call analogs at uh, redshifts less than six. But I think uh, one of the open questions about these types of systems is whether or not these analogs are actually truly representative of galaxies in the epoch of reionization. I think there's a subset of these uh, analogs, which are the Lyman continuum leakers. And you, as you heard earlier this morning, we actually only know a very few of these. Uh, many of them um, tend to have escape fractions lower than what you would expect uh, you would need to actually reionize the universe. So the second question we'd like to address is how can we better identify these Lyman continuum leakers across all redshifts? Now, there's a number of different methods for identifying Lyman leakers. Uh, a bunch of them are listed here on the left. I'm not going to go through all of them, of course, but one of the most popular methods is looking for galaxies which have a high ratio of O3 2. And you can see that's, as we define it, it's a log quantity of a bunch of oxygen 3 emission lines divided by a bunch of oxygen 2 emission lines. And the general idea behind this is that you can kind of imagine a very idealized molecular cloud, which has a zero escape fraction. You have your ionizing sources embedded, and then as the ionizing radiation is penetrating through this cloud, it's creating shells of regions that emit in oxygen three, oxygen two, and oxygen one. Of course, you can imagine a separate scenario where instead of having the radiation being bounded by the cloud, the radiation actually breaks through. And then when that happens, uh, you actually break in and eat away at the oxygen one and oxygen two emitting regions, which lowers your ratio of oxygen three to oxygen two. So that's why in general, people tend to focus on these types of galaxies. One of the big questions though is because we can't directly observe this ratio uh, at ratio of greater than six is whether the leakers that are reionizing the universe are actually represented by this type of interstellar medium physics. Now, uh, in order to actually compare with observations, we need to run simulations, of course. And so what I'm going to be doing is introducing a suite we call the Aspen simulations. And these are cosmological radiation hydrodynamic simulations. So they include a, a seven species non-equilibrium chemistry model. Most importantly, uh, the radiation is coupled to the molecular hydrogen uh, in the simulation. We're using eight bins of radiation transfer all the way from the infrared up to the helium-2 ionizing, including things like uh, the Habing band and Lyman Warner. Uh, in order to study the, in, study the interstellar medium, we need quite high resolution. So these simulations resolve down to about 10 parsecs in the interstellar medium. And most importantly, because we know the density, temperature, metallicity, and inhomogeneous radiation field in the interstellar medium, we can actually post-process every single cell uh, with a photoionization code like Cloudy to predict things like emission lines and nebular continuum. And if you do this uh, properly, you can see on the right, you can create these beautiful maps of things like oxygen three, 5,007 angstroms. You have your carbon three emission lines, which we've heard about, oxygen two emission lines. And just for this one galaxy, there's about 3 million Cloudy models that go into it. And we do this for the more than 1,000 galaxies at every single snapshot we output uh, in the simulation. So onto the results, we can directly look at whether or not the leakers uh, in these simulations actually have high ratios of O32. So what you're looking at on the x-axis is uh, the O32 for the simulated galaxies shown as the black points versus the Lyman continuum escape fraction shown on the y-axis. If we simply uh, take an O32 threshold of zero, we find that for the galaxies that have an O32 higher than this value, about 11% of them are actually leaking Lyman continuum radiation. In contrast, galaxies uh, that have lower O32 ratios, only about 1% of those are actually leakers. So in general, this basic physical model holds that you would expect there to be a bias that high O32 galaxies are Lyman continuum leakers. You can compare this with observations shown in cyan and magenta, and you can see that uh, the regions where the leakers that we observe uh, populate um, roughly are consistent with those from our simulations. Of course, we tend to find a number of galaxies in our simulations, the ones like focused down here at the bottom, which have high O32, but very low F escape. So what we can take away from this is that O32 seems to be a necessary condition for Lyman continuum escape, but it's insufficient uh, for high escape fractions. And I think one of the questions is, is why can you have galaxies with high O32, but low F escape? 
And I think there's two pieces of physics that are coming into play. The first one is viewing angle. So if we just focus on an individual galaxy and put ourselves right at the center, we can create a mole-wide projection of the neutral hydrogen column density. So everywhere you see a bright region is where the column density is like roughly optically thick. And everywhere you see a dark region is where Lyman continuum radiation can escape. So depending on which sight line you have, uh, F escape is a the global F escape is an angle average quantity, but of course that's not what we observe uh, with our telescope. So you might just be in a situation where you have high O32, which is not really impacted as much by viewing angle compared to F escape, which is very impacted by viewing angle. Now, in addition to viewing angle playing a role, there seems to be something going on in the interstellar medium that can actually cause high O32 but low F escapes. So I'm showing you examples of two galaxies. This one here on the top has a high F escape and a high O32, but this one here on the bottom has a low F escape and also a high O32. And if you just look at the density projections here in the second column, you can see the top one has a completely different morphology than the one on the bottom. This one is clearly being disrupted by feedback. You can actually see the low density channels through which radiation can escape. In contrast, the galaxy at the bottom uh, is much more compact. And these galaxies have very different morphologies, stellar masses, ionization parameters, and metallicities, despite having roughly similar uh, dark matter halo masses. So what this goes to show you is that uh, there's very complicated physics in the interstellar medium based on all of these different properties that can actually drive high O32 and low F escape in addition to things going on with viewing angle. Now, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that O32 is a somewhat useful uh, property to constrain the Lyman continuum escape fraction. The question is, is are these galaxies that, for example, redshift three and redshifts below a half that we've been observing uh, directly Lyman continuum escape actually representative of the high redshift population? And I think one of the best ways to actually answer that question is to look at things like strong line diagnostics. So I'm showing you an example here on the left. On the x-axis is R23, and on the y-axis is O32. The simulated galaxies are shown as the black points, and I've highlighted the leakers in our simulations uh, as the bright red points. Now, there's low metallicity galaxies that were studied by Nakajima et al. These are shown as cyan. These are the ones that are not, sorry, the cyan ones are leaking, and the magenta ones are not leaking. And you can see that in this R23032 plane, the regions that the observed galaxies at redshift three populate are actually completely consistent with what we see uh, in our simulations. And in fact, there's no really good way to separate leakers from non-leakers on this plane. Now, this one uh, diagnostic would suggest that yes, these redshift three galaxies tend to be good analogs of galaxies well deep into the epoch of reionization, but we can actually go further. We can look at a vast number of diagnostics. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but here's uh, the standard nitrogen two BPT diagram, uh, the, uh, the S2 BPT diagram, as well as things like the mass excitation relation. And over a number of these strong line diagnostics, we're finding surprisingly good overlap between where redshift three to four galaxies exist and what our simulations are predicting for galaxies at redshift greater than six. So uh, I'm fairly confident that most of the lower metallicity galaxies we have uh, that we're studying at Z3 uh, are actually consistent with those in the epic of reionization. Now, the second question we wanted to answer is, are there better ways of actually identifying these Lyman continuum leakers? And the reason we wanna do this is because as I showed you with this O32 diagnostic, only about 11% of them that have high O32 are actually Lyman continuum leakers. So what we've done is because we've measured so many of these different emission lines in our simulation, we can actually run some simple logistic regression models using something like L1 regularization to try and predict which combinations of lines are actually the most predictive of leaking Lyman and continuum radiation. So I'm just showing you a few examples of these logistic regression coefficients uh, compared to the different lines, just uh, here's about nine of them. And what I want you to focus on is whether or not the logistic regression coefficient is positive or negative. If the, if the coefficient is negative, it means that uh, that line anti-correlates with leaking radiation. In contrast, if it's positive, it means that it positively correlates with leaking radiation. And for the most part, the two most important lines that we see from these logistic regression models is the carbon-2-158 micron line and the oxygen-3-5007 angstrom line. Now, as you've heard earlier in this session, feedback, uh, sorry, F escape is a feedback regulated quantity. So in order to actually identify uh, Lyman continuum leakers, really what you need is lines that are 
going to one correlate with the uh, presence of feedback. So for example, as you're looking here at uh, density temperature diagrams, we have the, our oxygen three line is actually populating the regions of ionized gas that's uh, seemingly being impacted by supernova feedback. Hence why oxygen three, 5,000 angstroms, uh, correlates with high Lyman continuum leakage. In contrast, our carbon two 150A micron line is being emitted mostly from the neutral gas regions. And of course, if you have neutral gas, that's going to inhibit F escape. So the positive and negative correlations are directly related with where these regions populate, uh, where these lines populate in the interstellar medium. Now, you can ask how good are these logistic regression models at separating leakers from non-leakers? So what you're looking at here uh, on the x-axis is the carbon-2 luminosity, and on the y-axis is the oxygen-3-5007 angstrom luminosity. Once again, the cyan points are our leakers, and the uh, black points are our non-leakers. And the background color map shows you the probability given by the logistic regression model that the galaxy is a leaker or a non-leaker. And this sort of white dividing line shows roughly a 50% probability. And you can see visually that this, uh, this logistic regression model does a fairly good job at separating leakers from non-leakers. Unfortunately, very few surveys actually have measurements of both infrared and optical emission lines. So in order to try to directly compare this with observations, what we've done is we've trained a different uh, logistic regression model where we've replaced the oxygen 3 5007 angstrom line with an oxygen 3 88 micron line, which is of course also in the infrared. Now, since our logistic regression uh, model didn't pick this line out, it's gonna be slightly less accurate, but you can see from this plot, it does a relatively good job still of separating the cyan point leakers from the black point non-leakers. But of course, now that both of these lines are uh, in the infrared, we can directly compare to observations. So this uh, magenta points represent galaxies from the Dwarf Galaxy Survey. And what's interesting is that they tend to straddle these, right reg these uh, white regions, which means some of these galaxies we actually predict to be leakers, which while many we predict to be non-leakers. Unfortunately, we don't have measurements of the Lyman continuum escape fraction from all of these galaxies, but uh, hopefully follow-up observations can confirm or refute my model. However, as you heard earlier this week, one of the most interesting things we can do is that we actually have um, a number of galaxies directly in the epoch of reionization that have oxygen-3 and carbon-2 emission lines, so we can make predictions for whether or not those are leakers. And what we find is that this MAX 1149JD1 uh, galaxy at redshift 9.1 is our most promising uh, observed known galaxy to actually be leaking Lyman continuum radiation. So thanks so much for giving me this opportunity, and I'll leave up my conclusions. Okay, so Tom uh, Beck uh, asks, for these galaxies and the EOR, what is the time dependency uh, of the F escape? Does this vary significantly with time, such as Arata et al. 2019, or is it relatively constant per source? Yes, yeah, so the, in the simulations, uh, the F escape values fluctuate quite considerably. I mean, on very, very short time scales, we're talking mega years. Um, the good thing is, though, is that from our simulations, we also find that things like the carbon-2 and the oxygen-3 emission lines are also going to fluctuate with the properties of the interstellar medium. Um, so a lot of that should be encapsulated in sort of what time you're actually observing the galaxy, what those emission line luminosities are going to be. Okay. Uh, Gerald Melema asks, in your last figure, why are the EOR galaxies in their own unique location? which does not overlap with your models? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, it's simply because the EOR galaxies that we know about are just much more highly luminous. And this is not particularly surprising because with high redshift galaxies, you're of course going to observe the much more bright galaxies. Um, our simulations, the box size isn't big enough. So uh, you can see the brightest galaxies only have luminosities of around 10 to the 50, uh, 10 to the 40 ergs per second. So really we just need a little bit of a bigger box size in order to uh, probe these much higher luminous galaxies. So Livia uh, Vellini asks, uh, very nice, which is a very nice talk. Do you plan to include also oxygen-3, 52 micron in your predictions? Could it be useful to complement oxygen-3, 88 uh, microns as their ratio depends on gas density? Yeah, so we, we actually do predict oxygen 352 microns. You can kind of see it in this uh, plot here uh, in the top right corner. 
Um, so basically what we were trying to do is that the reason why we applied L1 regularization is because we wanted to try and come up with models that have the fewest number of lines because we figured that would make things easier for observers. As you add more and more lines into the logistic regression models, our ability to uh, classify galaxies as leakers versus non-leakers gets better and better. And that's unsurprising because as you can see, the regions where you have oxygen-3 uh, 52 microns, as, as you mentioned, are, are different from, from oxygen-388 microns. Uh, so yes, we, we do have like much more detailed models, but uh, I focused here in this talk just on the ones with two lines.